Grüß Gott. Zur Hi, for, for the psychoanalysis of the climate crisis. Before the uh, everyone gets uh, afraid. Ich weiß schon, dass man Psychoanalysen nur von Personen machen kann und nicht von einem Yeah, don't worry. I know that you can't psychoanalyze situations, but only people. But I want to talk about how are we treating the crises and how are we handling them. And I will be talking about why does a pandemic that could be handled is frightening us so and other things so this other pan um, crisis that is much more threatening in reality, why does it make it causes less fear in fact? On the one hand, it became obvious that the climate crisis is a scientifically proven fact. No serious scientist doubts that the climate emergency or climate crisis is happening and we have to take some serious action unless we want to have a bad situation on our hands and the pandemic might seem inconvenient but the pandemic will not kill the whole uh, whole humanity, even the Spanish flu killed a lot of people, but not all of us. In this pandemic, we have vaccinations, we can fight back, there will be a lot of death, but we'll be able to handle it. However, there is a lot of fear and uncertainty and the climate crisis that is really threatening us, that seems forgotten and seems to be ignored. And that has psychological reasons. The human soul, the human psyche has its limits, also with imagination. So if you go ahead and say, we have, just for, for a time, we have to limit ourselves until the pandemic is over, then that is burdening the psyche, but you can handle it. With problems, uh, so people with problems handle it less well, but the trouble is, if we don't change the whole way we interact with the world, then everything will go down. And realizing that is a lot more difficult, and handling it is a lot more difficult. And we know from wars and catastrophes that the human psyche cannot handle everything. There are limits to what we can handle. So, there are limits to the capacity. If you compare it to a computer, some things will run on it, but if you try to run too many applications at the same time, it will just break down, it will crash. And humans are similar. They lose their minds, they tilt, so a heavy system tilt, a system crash, and that can be seen in many cases. To avoid that, there are a few mechanisms for the psyche to protect itself. And just ignoring or pushing aside is one of those. So what mustn't be, cannot be. Or as a friend of mine said, when I explained it to her, when I explained to her something she didn't want to hear, she smiled at me and, well, I don't like that. I'll ignore that. So that's something we can do. That's something we do do. We ignore the climate crisis. Whenever people are confronted with facts they do not like, they can't handle, that does not fit their worldview, 
then they just push it aside and they'll become aggressive. A nice example, there was a tweet a few days ago, how aggressively people became, how aggressive people became in social media and how that is connected to the crises we are all facing. And that means if I expect something of the society and it happens differently, then I get something that's called cognitive dissonance. That means I see something where I should or expect to see something else and that causes a problem for me. And cognitive dissonances, if they are serious cases and are not solved, well, most people will react with cognitive morphing or distorting, uh, cognitive distortion. So it's also called a cognitive distortion field. So people ignore it and they argue against it. We are living in a quite scientifically defined and scientifically oriented society. So we do not believe that there are witches in each bush anymore or some bad wizards so we are we have a worldview that's mostly scientifically based and we believe when scientists say uh, tell us something and of course it's obvious by now that most scientists do not want to ignore the climate crisis they, they are not ignoring it, they are not pushing it down, they are just telling us it's here and if we do not act, these things will follow and none of them good. And people will react by not just ignoring the scientists, but they have to handle it by just denouncing it, saying it's pseudoscience, that's just wrong. And one reason why these conspiracy theories pro, uh, prolify and become more and more is that the people just cannot handle what the science, science is telling them. So they don't want to, they can't handle it. And so they have to, they can't just say, well, this one thing is wrong, it has to be interconnected, it has to still fit the worldview, and so they have to discredit a whole field. There has been a study by a British scientist, Stephen Lewandowski, on the University of Bristol. He researched that with uh, teenagers. They had different cultural backgrounds, so Muslims, conservative people, Christians, Jews, children, so a whole lot of different backgrounds. And he confronted them with scientific um, statements that sometimes counteract their beliefs and he studied their reactions and it was quite obvious that where the science conflicts with your convictions and you cannot resolve the cognitive dissonance, then your ideology, ideology will remain and the science has to take a stand back and will be morphed into or distorted into pseudoscience. So if your religion and your worldview tells you something, so it tells you that the world is just 6,000 some years old and then science says, no, 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 it's many billion years old, so different time scale then you have to ignore one of those. You have to say, well, the science is pseudoscience. This cannot be. And that's how it works in our society. We ignore not something because we want to ignore it. So that's not something we think about and do consciously. It's a protection mechanism because our psyche cannot handle it. If we didn't do that, we would go crazy, we would lose our minds. 
and the society going down the drains is certainly a heavy prospect that could break minds. And what could we do? Well, unfortunately, I don't really know. I don't have any idea what we could do. I can just explain what is behind this whole divog that we have to move step by step most uh, as objectively as we can and that we have to take to, to break the big problems into smaller pieces to not get too much resistance from the psyche of the majority of the society and we have to tell them, no, this is not pseudoscience, this is reality. No, if we don't act now, we will have a big, big problem. But yeah, if we wonder how can people be so stupid, well, they can be, and that's actually healthy. Well, it has a reason. So that is how the majority of people protects against situations that would be too much otherwise. So those that we recognize, those of us who recognized what's happening, we have to be careful and not everything at once, but we have to dissect the information and hand it out in smaller portions and just like a traumatic experience has to be handled carefully where people might just shut down so the same way we have to handle this when talking about the climate emergency and how to provide information to the society We'll have to put it into small, manageable bites, and once they're manageable, we can work with science again, and then it might or will be accepted. And this is kind of like an introduction to what we want to do the following days. We want to talk about how this is working, and thank you for your attention. So question, do you have an idea? how to make the climate crisis obvious, because it is a slow problem. How can we push the urgency? It's a very good question. Unfortunately, I do not have an answer, to be blunt. So if we could and knew so whoever has a good idea for that deserves a Nobel Prize. I do not have a solution. I'm a journalist by trade. I can point to problems, I can explain them, I can explain them, yeah, but I do not have solutions. What seems obvious to me or reasonable to me is to split the problem into smaller parts that we can then spoon feed to people. I know that if you tell people how we live, our way of living will stop tomorrow, then of course the reaction is panic. And then you have to say, no, it's not that bad, but it's at least a little bad. Also with trauma, you work by working on it bit by bit and as much as you can handle. And sorry, I do not have an answer. If someone comes up with an answer, welcome. You can get uh, rich and famous. Question? Yeah, that is a good segue to the second question. What's more important? I mean, the psyche or the climate? So, without protecting the psyche, we'll all hide and cannot save the climate. And without saving the climate, then there will be no human psyche at some point. Answer? Well, you have to see it that way. The climate doesn't care. The planet does not care. So, no more humans. Okay, fine. We are the ones that are threatened. 
So you have to see that the climate crisis is not a crisis of climate or the planet, it's a crisis of our existence. And that's a dilemma that we can't escape. It's very simple. Either we handle the climate crisis or it will devour us. That is the scary thing about it. It's like a train crash in slow motion. We know if we keep on going like we have, then in some 20 years everything will be over. Well, I can say I'll be 70, I, I might not care, but that that's not an argument. Humanity has to work on this problem. It'll have to. So the question is, once it becomes obvious, so obvious that nobody can ignore it anymore, it might be too late. Stupid example, but the, uh, the sea level will rise some 7 meters. We have a house relatively close to the sea, it's 30 meters away. I don't know when we'll notice that the sea is rising. So once it's rising, it's over. Everything is underwater. So at least close to the sea, a lot of people will be underwater. And one, uh, when they'll notice it, no idea. So yeah, both has to be protected. And it's difficult and we have to do it somehow. And no, I don't know how. Question? Yeah, so maybe we don't need panic. We just need to do something bit by bit. Answer? Yeah, probably that's the right approach. The problem is you have to be conscious of the problem. And the, excuse my French, the, the shit hit the fan. And well, we are doing a little, but probably not enough and too late, as usual. If we are lucky, we'll manage somehow. If we are not, we are not. That's it. Last question. What do you think? What can we do to get our hope back? Or what could we connect our hopes to? So the hope that we will solve this problem somehow. Answer. Well, there are a few approaches. You can have faith and say, well, God will, will save us all. If we do our part, that will probably work. If you do not have faith, it's diff more difficult. We probably have to have trust in ourselves. So far, we managed to survive everything. If you look at humanity for, I don't know, some 10,000 years or 30,000 years we are around, that's not very long. So if we do this now, we did well. Yeah, it's not much, I confess. I, I don't have much hope. I think, yeah. Grit your teeth and through. You have to get through to the other end somehow. And at every opportunity, do something. Every little bit helps. Every bit of aluminum foil that's recycled, every bit of paper that's recycled, every time you can avoid, don't, don't use the car. So bit by bit. And everyone we meet, keep talking to them, keep arguing with them, never stop, and a little hope we will have to manage to bring to the table. Sorry, I can't give more. Yeah, full agreement. Thanks, Andre. The translators were Franz T and B.